Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to tonight's webinar. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, Alex Matthews, uh, just a few housekeeping rules to go through. Um, everybody's muted and videos are off. If you have any questions or comments you want to give to Alex, uh, just provide them in the Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom of the screen on the right-hand side. Uh, the webinar will be recorded as well. Uh, we will have it up in the YouTube channel, in the Careful YouTube channel. Uh, after the after the presentation, so you can access it to to view it again, or if you have to leave early, there's also bases and neurosis uh, points available for the webinar. If you want to drop them into the chat function, your number, or you can email to me after the webinar is finished. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, and thanks for joining us, Alex, is Alex Matthews, the technical specialist with Fargo. Uh, he's going to give us a run through uh, of IPM strategy for ornamental crops. He's going to cover a number of different pests. And we'll cover a number of different topics and biological controls. Uh, Alex predominantly provides advice uh, to growers on IPM strategies, his special uh, areas on biological programs, uh, and looking at conventional uh, and biological compatibilities. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge, uh, and we met before uh, last year when I was over doing the basis. Uh, so it should be a very interesting and informative webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, as I said, please do ask them and we'll get them answered uh, uh, after his presentation. I'll pass you over to Alex now and he'll give a bit of an introduction to who he is and start the, the webinar for us. Thanks, Alex. Perfect. Thanks, Connor. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, basically, yeah, as, as Connor said, I, I sort of cover the eastern and, and southern counties uh, in the UK. So, predominantly based in uh, Kent. Um, so, I basically work uh, on the ground with growers providing technical advice on sort of all of this um, biological controls and sort of integrating the pest management approaches so um, as Connor mentioned I'm basically going to cover some of the key pests uh, that we see uh, within sort of ornamental pl plant production environments and uh, just try and unpack sort of how we how we approach um, those pests and in terms of biological controls and how we sort of approach them through the year with specific biologicals so hopefully i'm going to manage to cram that all into an hour so um yeah we'll make a start sorry just jump there um so basically just uh, to kick off so the main pests we're going to see are uh, the main pests we're going to speak about uh, tonight are aphids, white flies, spider mites, caterpillar thrips, slugs and snails, uh, vine weaver control, mealy bug and scale, leaf miner and scarid. So pretty much the key the key pests that we will see um, within sort of protected and, in, and outdoor environments as well when we're working with ornamentals. So I'll, um, I'll move straight into sort of looking at how biological work just as a just as a quick introduction just as just to show you um, how we sort of approach the biologicals and what sort of modes of action they 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 sort of attack the pests with so firstly uh, we use parasites so these are things like nematodes if you're using um, things like uh, vine weaver controls if we're using uh, nematodes to control they basically are, are parasites so they create a non-living mutual relationship with the organism. Um, so, uh, and they rely on basically um, another species uh, for part or all of its um, uh, development and survival, basically. So with the nematodes, for example, when we apply them, they enter into uh, the body um, of, for example, a, a, um, a vine weaver larvae. They then reproduce within the body and, um, and Feed on, feed on it, and then evacuate out once the host is is spent. Basically, so one um, one category uh, of biologicals that we use in terms of macrobiologicals, and then we've got uh, parasitoids. Now, parasitoids make up the large chunk of a really important group uh, of biological control because uh, these these are basically things like wasps that have a free living uh, adult stage, um, so they're very mobile in the adult stage through a crop canopy. So it makes them very good for targeting things like aphids, which we'll talk about later, because um, they need to move through that environment quite readily to actually target target any sort of small colonies, small small populations, and basically target them early before we've got a, a build up of um, build up of aphids, for example. So we 
with all the biological control we're trying to get in there early before we have a big outbreak so so we're not fighting fire um sort of later on in the season with a large large establishment of pests so they've got this free living adult stage and they'll enter so that so they'll have a larval stage within a single host um so for example an egg laid into an aphid um, which we'll talk about later um and then we move on to uh they, they'll basically uh, emerge out of that out of that host and then move into their adult stage as we spoke about with the free living free living uh, mobile adult stage then we've got things like predators so these attack the prey by feeding from the outside so piercing the cuticle uh, or the exterior shell of of the uh, pest itself so these are things like ladybirds large predators that um that basically attack they've, they've got um the ability to attack quite a wide um wider host range so they're they're more um they're, they're better generalist feeders of, of a range of of a range of different pest species and then we've got things like pathogens. Um, these are more within the microbiology. Uh, biology. So things like um, bacteria. We won't go into too much um, in this category within this talk, um, but these are things like biological sprays and uh, entomopathogenic fungus and things like that. Pathogens that basically can attack a, um, a living um, insect. So we, uh, and they basically, uh, have a, a sort of a knockdown effect um, on uh, as a spray application, really. So predominantly in this talk, we'll talk about the uh, parasites, parasitoids and predators as the three as the three main categories. So moving straight into uh, our first key pest, so aphids. So when we're looking at identification of aphids in the environment, um, they can be quite distinct um, with the uh, black um, deposits, as you see on the rose, uh, in the rosemary on the left-hand side. So these black deposits are basically um, a sooty mould that's got hold of, uh, that's basically colonised where the honeydew um, has been deposited. So the honeydew is, a high, is high in sugars and it's a byproduct of aphid feeding. Um, so they excrete this honeydew and deposit it basically deposits on the plant and then the black sooty mould colonizes it so we can see this is quite a distinct feature in the crop they also um, shed skins as they go through their life stage they they shed skins into the next life stage and these are white these are these white skins on the right hand side and they're quite distinct in the crop so if we're starting to see sort of early early small colonies um, about then then these these small um, these white skins will basically be present and quite distinct against the green leaf surface. Identification of species. So we've got quite a wide range of different aphid species, especially within ornamental plant production, because we're growing such a, a wide variety of different plant species. So um, we mainly categorize these to make it to make it easy. We mainly categorize these aphid species into sort of round and elliptical bodied species so the elliptical are more of the sort of larger bodied aphids and then the round rounder bodied aphids are generally a bit smaller so um, we've got key, uh, key pests uh, key aphid species here so on the left hand side we've got the um, peach potato aphid in the middle we've got the melon cotton aphid and on the right hand side um, it's the black bean aphid so three really important species that we will predominantly see uh, within the growing environment so um, we basically, with things like parasitoid wasps that we use to control these species, they can be quite um, specific in terms of the species they're trying to um, target. So when we're selecting a parasitic wasp species to try and control these aphids, we, we can put mixes in and things like this, uh, things like that, because obviously the parasitoids need to live in, as I said, um, live in a living, a living host. So they have, um, they have, uh, they're a bit more specialised in terms of the body sizes they they sort of require depending on the species. So, um, which is why we generally put in aphidious mixes um, just to cover the wide range of aphid species that we do see, especially within that uh, ornamental sort of production environment. So the first aphidious sort of wasp species that we're going to cover. So um, th these um, aphidious um, Aphidius colmani and Irvine are the, the two key species that we use for control. So, as I said about the round and elliptical bodied aphid species, so 
Um, Colmani, Aphidius Colmani, will predominantly target sort of rounder bodied aphid species, where, whereas Aphidius ervi will target sort of the more, the, the sort of larger elliptical bodied aphid species. Um, and then we've got Athelinus and, and other species that we can put in just to target. There's, there's a broader range of, of aphid species. Um, so the parasitoids are active from about 10 degrees and above. Um, and as I said, they, they, uh, they need to parasitize. So they, they basically implant, implant an egg into the aphid. Um, and we can see that on the right hand side in the bottom image. So um, when, we, when they parasitize the, the aphid, they basically swell up. And um, you can see this on the right hand side. They turn sort of a golden sort of mummy color. Um, and then when the wasp is ready to release, um, release from the host, it will then cut its way out um, of, the, of the body. And you can see um, sort of when the wasp starts to release that hole emerge and then they'll release out as, as, um, as adults, as that free living, uh, free living adult stage. And they'll move quite freely around the environment, searching out uh, the aphid by the center of the honeydew. Um, and which makes them very effective for sort of early aphid. If we're getting aphid that's moving um, in through events, in through vents, for example, so winged aphid, these are really good at targeting those sort of early populations um, before uh, there's a real buildup. So with, as, I get, as I said earlier, we're not fighting fire later on in the, uh, with big, with big um, established colonies. The emergence from the aphid mummy takes approximately approximately two weeks. Um, so uh, we'll go on to talk about some of the applications. So this is basically how we apply them. So um, if we if we we sort of do straight mix, mixes, so just Aphidius colmani or just Irvi, um, we generally apply those sort of within the release boxes, as you can see on the right hand side. Just the these are just um, cardboard boxes that you can just hang out um, within the crop um, or onto, say, stanchions if you've got um, uh, tags to sort of hold them onto. Um, and then we also do the uh, we also do these mixes as well. Um, the 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 tube on the right hand side at the bottom is basically a five way mix of um, different uh, five different um, aphidious wasp species um, or not just aphidious, but other a mix of five different aphidious wasps, basically. Um, and these are um, these these target the wide range of of um, of aphid species that we do see these these mixes are specialized um, for for sort of ornamental plant production uh, this this mix specifically but we can also because this is a flower mix but we also we also do uh, specialist mixes for sort of berries um, and sort of strawberry production and, and all sorts of different things so so we can specifically target with with um, the right uh, parasitoid wasp species um, for that situation. So we sort of got, have a good understanding of what specific aphids are going to target a specific crop. So we can sort of target um, the parasitoid wasps accordingly. Um, moving on to the predators. So, so as I was saying, the predators um, eat uh, from the outside in, so they, they pierce the cuticle or the outer shell. So the chrysoperla or green lacewing are used very extensively for um, a lot of hotspot targeting um, of, of um, aphid. Um, so, so the lacewing, as you as you can see on the bottom right, you'll you'll probably have seen these before overwintering indoors. Um, they're quite distinct. Um, these bright green uh, insects with these large wings. Um, so these feed off most soft-bodied prey. So they um, they they regarded as generalist feeders, but they're, they're mainly applied for sort of um, for aphid control. So they will also feed on um, a little bit of spider mite and white fly, um, but they're, they're most effective for aphid control. Um, so, yeah. Moving on to another predatory species. So Aphidolites, um, Aphidolites aphidomyza is a gall midge. Um, so this is a midge that lays an egg directly into an aphid colony. And it basically the the midge um, is this um, is this sort of orangey color um, sort of looking maggots um, on the top right hand side. When it's laid into the middle of a colony, it's this species is really good at targeting entire aphid colonies. 
Um, so, and it's got quite a wide range, uh, host range, because it's able to, it basically bites into the legs of the aphid and um, injects a paralyzing toxin and sucks out all the juices from that. So, um, because of because of that mode of attack, it's able to target quite a wide range of different um, aphid species. So we don't have to be as selective as we are with, um, say, the parasitoid wasp species, because it doesn't have to actually live with inside its host. So um, a very effective predator um, to put out, and we, we, we do see them quite abundantly naturally occurring. Um, if you're sort of turning over leaves and seeing those, those larval formations sitting within those aphid colonies, Obviously, you know that there is a bit of, um, if you're not applying bio already or applying the species, you know there is a bit of natural biological or natural populations of fidelites in the environment. Um, it will go into diapause, so, um, so this is a sleep state at low levels. So um, we're not, uh, don't apply between um, sort of mid uh, sort of mid October to mid March. Um, so yeah fine to apply outside of those outside of those times if we've got sort of artificial light it probably will stimulate some activity but yeah between mid-october and mid-march we, we wouldn't really put this species in and that's just a bit of a breakdown of sort of the species that we've uh, got available so the parasitoid wasps on the top left hand side the aphidolites on the top right and then the the lacewing. Um, uh, I didn't speak about um, ladybirds, but they're very effective when we do apply them in the adult and larval stage. A very voracious predator of um, of aphid. And uh, we've also got uh, the sticky traps. Yellow sticky traps are really effective generalist uh, catch for um, for winged aphid. Um, so we can. It's important that we're putting those out in the environment um, to try and catch it this sort of early movement um, through the vents of the aphids. And just moving on to sort of natural biological control as well. So we've got the ladybird species, um, obviously, that occur very naturally. Um, we've got the, the hoverflies at the bottom. So on the left hand side, obviously, that, that is a hoverfly adult. And then we've got the larval stage on the bottom right. So um, obviously, if you're seeing that sort of larvae on the underside of a leaf, obviously don't squash it because it's one of the good guys. Um, and we've got aureus on the top left, which is um, is mainly we we do put it in as a commercial predator, and I will talk about it a bit later in the talk. But it's um, it's basically predominantly used as a commercial product for thrips control, but also a very good generalist. Moving on to white fly control. So uh, the main species we see is Trilorodes, which is the glasshouse white fly. As you see on the top right hand side, this is a male and a female sitting together on the leaf surface. Um, these have a wide host range and they can build up in really high numbers quite, quite quickly uh, given the right conditions and they move very abundantly. Um, they, can, they can move in, in quite significant populations um, across an environment and in and through vents. Um, so if we've got environments where we've got um, close by sort of tomato growers or soft root growers and things like that, and they're pulling out a crop, obviously that food source is depleted within that environment. So we get a lot of evacuation off of those environments. And and if you're unlucky enough to live near them, um, then if they can depending on the wind direction, they can migrate into your area. So, so important that we um, that we're sort of monitoring for that and that we're putting in biological control early. They again excrete honeydew. So um, as as with the aphids, we get that build up of sooty mold on the leaf surface, that black sooty mold that just colonizes it um, from that sort of high sugars, living off those high sugars within the honeydew. The parasitoid wasps that we use uh, mainly for control of glasshouse whiteflies. So we've got Encarsia formosa, um, which is a uh, which is a parasitoid wasp, which is it injects an egg into the scale, um, and with a sort of minimum temperature is about 12 degrees, but we want about 15 for for really good activity. But we can start putting them in about 12 degrees. The Arepmoceris is another species, a bit wider host range um, than in Encarsia, which is um, Encarsia is just specifically for glasshouse whitefly. But the Arepmoceris has a bit wider host range because unlike Encarsia, which injects an egg into the actual scale, Arepmoceris lays an egg sort of underneath the scale. 
Um, so we can use it if we've um, if we've got issues with um, sort of other whitefly species in the environment, things like honeysuckle whitefly, or if there's been identified Bermisia um, tabaki, which is a notifiable um, whitefly species. If if, um, if sort of plant health comes in and advises to put in a bio program, then we'll most likely put in the Eurepnoceros over the Incarsia because the Eurepnoceros will be able to target that um, sort of wider group of, of whitefly species. Um, but it requires, the Eurepnoceros requires a bit higher temperature, so a minimum temperature of about 17 degrees and above. Um, this is a licensed predator as well, so we can only sort of apply it in, um, in glass house conditions, unlike Incarsia, which, which uh, doesn't carry any licensing. So in terms of the application for white flies, so we predominantly put the white fly control with the parasitoid wasps out in these um, uh, with these um, cards on the on the uh, right hand side. So you can see um, on these cards that basically the there's this small dot on the cards, and you get 60 pupae or or scale uh, basically parasitized white fly scale on that small dot. Um, and from that, the wasps, the parasitoid wasps are basically released. So it's important when we're putting those cards out not to damage or uh, that particular area of the card um, and basically ensure that the card doesn't get too wet as well. They'll take a couple of days to emerge from there. Um, as you can see on the bottom right, so when when the Incarsia is, um, it parasitizes the scale, it basically turns the scale black um, as you can see, uh, whereas a healthy scale would would be sort of white to sort of a yellow yellowish color, um, the parasitized scale um, turns black. So when we see that, um, we know that the biological control is active and working. Um, and those black scale are basically a water contained on that dot on that card, basically. Um, so we generally apply the cards. Uh, we we generally apply them every five to ten meters squared. I'll move. Sorry, there we go. Um, we've also got uh, Macrolophus as well. Macrolophus is a really effective um, white fly control. Um, basically, this is a mirrored bug, um, and we see it really work really well on banker plants. So we'll talk about banker plants a bit later. But on things like aubergines, if we can put plants out in the environment and establish the Macrolophus on, then they they do work really well. Um, they've got quite a long life cycle so so whereas a lot of these parasitoid wasps are only a, they they live for a few weeks um depending on the conditions um but uh yeah these these mirrored bugs are basically have quite a long life cycle so we can put one to two applications in early in the season um and basically build up the populations from there we sometimes need to supplement their food sort of early on in early on in the season if we've got quite low um, pest populations just to try and get the species uh, just to try and get them going um, and established in the crop but they do work really well we do we do see macrolophus um, work really effectively for for white fly control and that's just sort of goes into a bit of depth about the glasshouse white fly uh, sort of life cycle and how we sort of approach um, the biological control so we've got the mite species in there. I haven't gone into too much detail about the mite species, but we can use mite species basically to um, target some of the egg stages. So if we, we, if we are applying mites, then we can target that sort of early stage. But predominantly, we'll be using things like Incarsia and Macrolophus to target that sort of scale stage. Um, and then we've also got uh, the sticky traps. The yellow sticky traps are very effective for catching the adults. So um yeah it's important that we have those in the environment if we do get as i said if we do get a mass um sort of movement across an environment of the of the glasshouse whitefly adults that is your first point of defense really um is those yellow sticky traps so very important that we have them up in the environment moving on to thrips so thrips damage so this um this is classic damage from thrips as we can see on this basil leaf on the right hand side so this is a rasping damage and basically you get these black dots within the feeding damage and uh, the black dots are basically fecal matter 
um, that they deposit within that feeding. Um, so that's always quite distinctive against it can also often be confused with leaf hopper damage, um, but uh, those black deposits within the feeding damage are quite distinct. The most common species that we see are western flower thrips, um, and it, these are basically um, they, these originally came across. This species originally came across from North America, but has taken over a very wide host plant range and um, is is very extensive. Um, this is one of the majority, uh, the main species that we will see within a growing environment. Um, it's effect of a virus, so it is it can transmit viruses. Um, through through feeding practices um, and has potential to cause severe economic damage to fruiting um, flowering parts of the plant and uh, the foliage. Um, it's very important that we establish the biological control early for this um, for this species because of its um, resistance to actives including spinosad and abamectin. So the key um, thrips control products that we've got on the market, it has built. Uh, it has built up um, a bit of resistance um, to to those key actives. So important that we're putting the biological control out early um, and resorting to those products really, those spray products is really a last resort, um, which in turn, uh, they'll, if, the less we use those products, um, the re it will basically reduce their sensitivity to them. So they'll be more effective um, later on uh, if we if we do have to turn to apply to that. Um, turn to applying that uh, that that, that um, specific group of um, insecticides. That's just looking at the life cycle of the western flower thrip. So uh, we've got the egg stage, which is generally laid into the actual leaf surface itself. Then it goes through a first and second interstellar stage on the leaf surface. And depending on the species uh, with Western flower thrips, they'll fall off the actual leaf surface and pupate within the soil structure. They'll then emerge out as this adult stage, which is a winged adult and very mobile in the environment. If we if we are relying on spray applications, if we've got quite dense populations and the biological control hasn't worked, um, then we uh, if if it's got on top of the biological control, then we need to be we need to really understand this life cycle in terms of the spray application to ensure that we're repeating at least twice a spray application because we'll uh, if you imagine with an initial spray application you'll be targeting everything above uh, so everything above the soil structure so that sort of first and second into the larval stage in the adult um, but then we'll get this re-emergence of the next generation so it's important that we um, we spray um, put that repeat spray in for that next generation that's emerging out of the soil structure. But when we're approaching with the biological control early, we can really um, we've got a really good portfolio of, of species that can target pretty much all of this um, life cycle. So we'll go into a bit more depth about that moving forwards. Um, onion strips as well are uh, are quite um, a a big um, species as well that we need to be um, watching out for. Um, so, um, similar to sort of Western flower thrips, it's um, yeah, it has quite a wide host range. So, another species to just keep an eye out for. I won't go into too much detail um, about this, but yeah, just another species to look out for. Um, Heliothrips or, or glasshouse thrips have been a real issue last year. So um, we saw we saw significant populations last year, um, and as the name goes, it's it's predominantly a glasshouse thrip species. Um, but last year we did see it um, uh, moving outdoors as well, and it it did cause significant damage outdoors um, in certain areas. Um, as we can see, it's it's quite a distinct. Um, distinct pest uh, thrip species in the fact that a lot of the colonies sit on that leaf surface and on the right hand side you can see all the larvae and the adults um, sitting as a colony so these uh, these will um, pupate on the leaf surface unlike things like uh, species like um, western flower thrips which will drop off the plant these will literally uh, pupate on that leaf surface and have quite a rapid life cycle um, so one to be aware of um, and that's just looking at the damage. So you can see how it sort of really causes that. It causes quite extensive defoliation um, and starts quite low in the crop canopy 
and then basically moves moves its way up, as you can see in the um, at the bottom um, of the picture there. Um, so a really a really key pest that we need to start uh, that we need to keep an eye out for. Hopefully the cold snap. We've had a few cold snaps this winter, so hopefully it's it's um, it's controlled in that it's controlled a lot of the outdoor outdoor populations. Um, so yeah, we'll see what holds this year, but um, we do have biological control that will control um, this particular species. So this species originates from South America. Um, as I said, usually isolated to glass houses. However, we have seen it um, move outdoors with the hot summer last year. Because, because as I was saying, uh, with it over um, sort of um, the larval stage um, existing on that leaf surface, it has a much it has a larger insta larval stage, second insta larval stage. So uh, the majority of our um, the usual biological controls that we use are not as effective. Things like Amblyseus cucumeris, which we'll talk about in a bit more depth. Um, so we just have to look to switch up with Amblyseus mondorensis, which is more effective for targeting that second insta larval stage. So it's important that we're sort of keeping an eye out for if, if those larger um, thrip species, um, just as it requires a bit of switching up with the biological control. Um, yeah, so the Montorensis is again a licensed product, so uh, a licensed predatory species, so um, only to be applied under sort of the glasshouse condition, um, which is unfortunate um, if we are starting to get it outdoors. So, um, but yeah, we do have that licensing for for under protected structures. So moving into the mite species, so the the predators that we use for control of um, the thrips. Um, so Amblyseus cucumeris is the most widely ap uh, applied, um, applied at about 50 to 250 mites per meter squared. And this mite will basically um, predate the larval stages, the second, uh, first and second into the larval stages of things like western flower and those onion thrips. Um, so, and, and a much wider group of other thrip species, but just keeping an eye out for whether we do have any of those glasshouse thrips in that aren't as well controlled with cucumeris. Um, so we apply them as a as sort of a loose product or a sachet design. So these sachets, as, as you can see on the bottom right hand picture, um, these contain sort of a breeding colony, um, which will release continuously release over the course of about four to six weeks, depending on the temperature. Um, very effective for just continued uh, continued control um, across this um, time frame. Uh, just if we do get any um, establishment of, of thrips, we've got those mites on the leaf surface actively predating on those early um, early emergencies of, of thrips. As I say, with the glasshouse um, thrip species, we use um, a different species called Amblyseus montorensis, um, which is very effective for targeting. It's a, it's a bit of a bigger predator than, than Amblyseus cucumeris. So, um, we use this for targeting sort of those larger thrip species. So if you're finding you're not getting as good, good control with the Amblyseus cucumeris um, with thrips control, then we can use this species. And this species is also useful for targeting those um, white fly eggs as well. So if we're also getting white fly in the vicinity um, of the growing crop, then we can also apply this species um, just, to, just to target sort of, it's a bit more of a, a generalist feeder. Um, on sort of white fly and thrips, so very effective. And again, we apply them in sort of the loose product range, uh, loose material, um, and also the sachet ranges, extensive sachet ranges for that continued release of four to six weeks. Um, again, just remembering that it's only it's restricted under license for that glass house um, situation. Amblyseus swirsky uh, is another is again another another mite species that we use. Um, more effective sort of look at switching this uh, to this species from the um, from the others if it if the temperatures are lifting if we're getting very high temperatures um, then the Amblyseus swirsky is very is is a lot more effective than uh, than in, for example cucumeris um, so it requires a minimum temperature temperature of about 18 degrees and above but uh, just a bit more effective within those warmer conditions. Um, but just remembering this is again restricted under license um, for glass house. So, um, so yeah, just just one to um, one to be aware of um, that is on the market. If you if you aren't getting brilliant control with the sort of cucumeris species um, into those warmer months. 
and then we move on to the predatory species. Um, so things like aureus. Um, so aureus is also known as a flower bug. So very abundant within the natural environment and uh, able to control the adult stage. So um, as well as the larval stages because of its stabbing proboscis. So you can see on the top right hand side, it's sort of like a sword that protrudes out the front of the uh, of the insect. And it's basically able to stab into the into the thrift species itself, making it very effective um, and one of the um, few controls, um, really effective biological controls that we've got for the um, for the thrips adult stage. So this species complements itself really well against the mite species. Um, and then we've also got the Chrysoperla as well that I mentioned about being a generalist feeder. So the lacewing um, generalist feeder on things like predominantly aphids, but also mealybug, moth eggs, spider mites and caterpillars and obviously on uh, on thrips as well. Finally, it's all for hypoaspis is a another mite species, but um, will really uh, is really applied mainly mainly for sciarids, which we'll talk about a bit later, and predates through the soil structure basically. So um, very good for feeding on uh, for targeting the pupal stages of uh, of the thrips as they drop off that leaf surface into the soil structure. If we've got hypoaspis abundant in that soil structure, it'll be able to target those pupal stages. So a good um, sort of uh, if we're looking at the entire thrips, uh, thrips life cycle, as we see here. So um, we've got the mites uh, targeting sort of the, that first and second instar larval stage, as well as the aureus, obviously with that stabbing proboscis. And then moving forward into sort of that pupil stage in the spore structure, we've got the hypoaspis and the theta, which I didn't talk about, um, but it's another ground roving beetle that we have available. Um, which would be again mainly used for sciarid control, which we'll talk about a bit later. And then moving into that adult stage, so we've got the auris obviously um, targeting the adult stage, but then we've also also got the sticky traps. So blue sticky traps are the most effective um, that we've got for for thrips adults. Um, blues being the blue traps have been found to just be more effective, and we do an extensive range of pattern designs and also pheromones as well that we've got impregnated into these traps. For things like uh, for species specifically um, western flower thrips, if you're going to put out any traps, if you if if you've got any yellow tr sticky traps, these will still work very effectively. It's just the blues being found to be a, a bit more a bit more effective than the yellow. Uh, moving on to spider mites, so uh, tentranicus. So this is the two spotted spider mite. Um, the life cycle, as you can see on the bottom right, so we've got the egg stage, the larva. Protonymph, deuteronymph, and adult. Real preference for sort of warm, dry environments. So we we really see this species take off into those hotter months. Um, and we we saw uh, quite extensive populations last year just because of that those really hot conditions where we we're getting up to like 40 degrees um, sort of in the midday. Um, when they overwinter, so the spider mites overwinter um, as um, these sort of mated, these are mainly mated females that sit within the uh, main vein or within the leaf litter or even the structure of, um, of a glass house or polytunnel, for example. And they turn this orangey colour. Oh, I think this, hopefully this video will work. Yeah, so um, they turn this sort of orangey colour in response to the reducing day length, um, daylight, nutrition within the um, within their food source. So um, as with the reduced sap flow sort of in that winter months, they, they basically respond by turning into this um, this sort of colour. You'll probably never you'll, you'll never effectively spray them off in this stage. So um, yeah, they're, they're very tricky to control once they've entered this stage and they can respond to a spray program. Um, if we're putting a spray in as well, something like a Dynamec application or, or along those lines, they can respond by going into this dipole state, um, which just when they're not feeding on the plant, so they're not uptaking that active, so very difficult to control, um, which is why we, we see really um, the best control using biologicals and using them effectively if we can understand when to actually put the, the particular biological control in at the right time. So we'll, we'll go into um, what species um, to choose through the year, basically, uh, depending on the conditions. 
So the first species, the main species um, that we use for um, for spider mite control is Phytocelus, a very effective predator of specifically just two spotted spider mite. Um, it's got these long legs, so very effective at moving across that uh, webbing structure, and it will target all stages of the of the spider mite life cycle. Um, requires about 12 degrees and above um, for for uh, activity, um, but once we're getting above sort of 30 degrees, it does go to sleep a bit. So um, if we're just relying on Phytocelus, if we've got quite a high crop canopy, um, then we can get a bit of separation where the spider mites really like the warm, dry environment, so they'll move up the canopy. And if we're persisting above 30 degrees, the Phytocelus sort of will move down that canopy, so we can get a bit of separation. So at that stage, we will look to switch them up, and I'll talk about how we do that in the next couple of slides. So um, the Amblyseus andersoni is used for sort of the early stages. So as I was saying, with those, that diapausing, those diapausing spider mites, the Amblyseus andersoni is a native species and active down to quite a cool temperature of um, six degrees. So we're, we're able to get this species established early, um, and uh, it's got quite a high, well, wide host plant range so so it will also feed on pollens without um, damaging any of the crop and, and fungal spores and things like that just to try and sustain itself in the environment so we can get a good established population um, so very effective for putting um, in early um, just to target any of those micro colonies of spider mites and it will all this species will also feed on um, uh, thrips to a certain extent uh, rust mites gall mites things like fuchsia gall mites um, it's a very good generalist, so a good predator to have sort of early season, and if we're if we're putting applications outdoors, quite effective for putting outdoors as well. The Californicus, as I said, uh, going back to sort of with the Phytocelus, if we're reaching above that sort of 30 degree mark that's persisting, and we get that separation in the crop canopy, we can use Amblyseus californicus. As the name goes, it originates in California, so a non-native species and licensed under glasshouse conditions um, and it basically uh, because it comes from that sort of drier warmer condition uh, environment it's better adapted to those warmer conditions so we can switch it up for the phytocelus um, when those temperatures really start rising so a very effective species um, sits a bit more in the sort of preventative um, it's it's not as good at getting on top of like really established um, sort of larger populations of of, of a spider mite compared to phytocelus just because the the body type um obviously on the phytocelus the legs are quite large and it's the phytocelus is able just to move across that webbing a bit easier so um but the amblyseus californicus is a good option for sort of later on uh or sort of mid-summer applications when we've got those temperatures persisting above 30 degrees under protected structures Moving on to sort of slugs and snails, so I'm not going to talk about uh, too much about damage because I imagine you um, most of you uh, will be aware of what the sort of slug damage looks like, but it sort of um, puts those uh, sort of holes through the actual uh, plant foliage. Um, a very very common pest of most plants, active in those warm moist conditions. Um, so. We mainly look at, uh, we have got Nemeslug, uh, which is a nematode species available on the market. So Phasma um, habitites um, is, a, is a good um, biological that we can use. Um, so it's active down to about five degrees. Um, so uh, it basically, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, nematode species, it's sort of, the nematodes need a bit of a film of moisture to move through. So make sure you're not applying nematodes within sort of uh, two dry conditions, so ensuring that that environment isn't drying out too quickly. Um, and it will control the majority of slug species and also those small, small water snail species. Nemeslug, um, this species isn't as good on sort of a wider group of snail, uh, snail species just because of that life cycle, but um, very effective um, uh, for, for slug species. Moving on to scary controls, so um, we are we are finding scarids, um, or, or I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the sort of life cycle and identification first. So um, as you sort of um, as you can see on the on the top right hand side, so that's the adult scarid, um, also known as a fungus gnat. Um, so quite distinctive with it. it's it's a very small fly um, with protruding antennae. Um, so it's not 
considered crop damaging at this stage, um, but it can be a bit of a vector for viruses, uh, for, for diseases, um, for example, fusarium, um, just because it can sort of move, it moves around very abundantly within in the environment. And when we do have extensive populations, if we're moving our hand across the crop canopy, um, sort of just above the soil structure, um, the soil layer, um, we'll see quite a lot of these flies moving around quite abundantly. Uh, when they do get into quite high populations and they've got quite a rapid life cycle. So they can go from just a few populations to quite a lot in, in a short space of time. The larval stage, as you can see on the bottom right hand side, which is um, the, it's got this sort of um, black head, distinct head capsule um, and white, whitish sort of body. Um, this is the stage that will do the damage to the rooting structure. So um, they they basically feed on root systems and they're obviously because they um, are feeding on those root systems, they're a lot more damaging to sort of younger plants um, just because they have a, a bigger effect on that small, sort of smaller root structure. So an important uh, pest to, can, uh, to, to be aware of within sort of propagation environments. Um, the yellow sticky traps are really very effective um, really very effective for for um, catching the uh, adults. Um, so we use these very extensively if we've got if we know we've got um, populations of scarid, if you've got yellow sticky traps out, they will be very effective just ensuring depending on what traps you've got out, um, just ensuring that the traps are facing the sun um, as much as possible just because um, say, for example, the yellow traps are, are working off um, light reflection. So the more light we can reflect off that trap, the better trap um, catch we will get, basically. Um, we use nematodes, uh, specifically some nematode species Steinonema feltii, which will parasitize the larval stage of the sciarid. We can also use the hypoaspis miles, as we were talking about with the thrips control. Um, for those pupil stages, the hypoaspis is basically an abundant, uh, it's, it's, um, it, it works um, within that soil structure. It's a, it's a soil roving mite species and active down to about three centimetres within the growing media and very effective for preventative control of sciarid. We can also put in a theta, which is a, a ground roving beetle. Um, and we, we also sell um, the Atheta buckets as well, which is a, which is a um, uh, basically a breeding colony. You get, um, you basically get food and instructions on how to sort of maintain the populations and you can sort of raise your own colonies from that um, and carry them on um, as long as they're sort of fed on a high protein feed, things like fish pellets, crushed up fish pellets, and we can sort of sustain the populations moving forward. Uh, with the with the acetic buckets just being sure that um, we're sort of keeping an eye out for any ammonia buildup or any smells because it can turn into sort of a scarred breeding ground which is sort of the opposite of what we're trying to achieve so the athleta can be very effective um it's it's very mobile in the environment a lot more mobile than hypoaspis because it's it's a flying uh beetle um so very effective sort of preventative control i put watering watering on here so just looking at those culture control methods so um watering is really important that um if we can retain sort of a dry top crust um, on the top layer of the soil, it will greatly reduce down the uh, laying ability for, um, for the scarred adults, basically. So we can get a really good culture control in uh, just by just slightly adjusting watering practices. Um, and also, um, we're just starting to see more, um, a bit more of an issue with scarage just with the movement to peak free as well, because um, just of that natural breakdown of woody fibres, we do get um, a build up of, um, of fungus um, just as a natural breakdown, um, which um, just provides a bit more food source for the adult adult stages. So just important that we're, we're being a bit more of aware of scarid um, with the movement to peak free. The mini bugs, so um, two, two key um, Two key sort of families, um, Planococcus and Pseudococcus, um, have a wide host plant range and becoming more, more and more of an issue um, moving forwards and becoming quite difficult to control um, with the loss of a lot of systemic sort of all incorporated um, insecticides. Uh, these are sap suckers and again produce that honeydew um, release um, and again sort of colonising sooty mould. 
um, is quite a key um, a quite a key indicator for them. And they can live on se inert surfaces for several months, so a very persistent pest um, in a growing environment. And um, yeah, as I said, becoming more and more of an issue. Um, and the dead bodies can remain on the plants for a considerable about, considerable amount of time. So we'll we'll go into a bit more about each individual species. So plant across the clock is, uh, citri, um, is, uh, is also known as the citrus mealybug. Um, these adult females basically produce these egg clusters, as you, as you can see on the top right hand side, these sort of orangey to yellow egg clusters that the adult sits on uh, on top of. Um, and you can see the sort of um, waxy filaments around the edge with no tail. So it's quite important when we're sort of looking at these species uh, that we're looking sort of tail length just to try and respond accordingly with the biological control. And I'll sort of move on to um, Pseudococcus, um, which is the long-tailed mealybug species. So the long-tailed mealybug species is the important one to, to watch out for because unlike the uh, Pseudococcus uh, viburnii, which is the below, the um, long-tailed mealybug species, which has a tail as long as the actual body itself, gives birth to live young. Um, so that's quite important, where, whereas the other species basically produce an egg sac um, so that's important in terms of the biological control and how we approach with certain species. Um, so cryptolemus, this is a specific species for that we use for just controlling um, for controlling uh, mealybug. Um, so going back to that um, long-tailed mealybug species only um, giving birth to live young, the cryptolemus requires a um, the, that sort of egg sac um, producing species to actually really establish itself. Um, so when we're looking at the long-tailed mealybug species, we'll look at um, say a, um, a chrysoperla or a lacewing. Um, but for but for things like uh, the um, the citrus mealybug, um, uh, we look at using uh, cryptolemus, which is um, so the cryptolemus is is an Australian ladybird. Um, and feeds on uh, sort of it will feed on all species, but only really gets itself established with the with the um, sort of egg laying um, mealybug species. Usually applied sort of later in the day, um, sort of um, towards sort of lower light levels. So uh, because if they can sort of fly into the light um, and die, so so just advised to apply them later on. Um, and that's the larval stage, as you can see on the left hand picture as well. So the larval stage can look quite a lot. It does look a bit like a mealybug. Um, so we do get issues of people thinking they've squashed it and it's a mealybug. But yeah, if we're seeing those on the plant that we know that we're there, um, they've established and they're actively the biological control is is basically working really effectively. And that's the Chrysoperla lacewing larvae. So again, a generalist feeder. And we'd, if we were approaching the biological control with control of um, the long-tailed mealybug species, remembering that the long-tailed mealybug species produces live young, we'd uh, we'd basically select this species just as a generalist predator to try and feed on the sort of earlier instalarval stages of that long-tailed mealybug. To sort of scale insects, so. Um, we, we see an extensive array of, of different scale species and they're really tricky to control if we do get them um, sort of established um, in, the, in the growing environment. So the soft scales produce honeydew. So again, the sooty mold build up quite a key indicator um, on a plant um, if, we, if we are getting scale abundantly. And then we've got armoured um, or hard scales which don't produce honeydew. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because there's such a vast array of different scale species. Um, so yes, yeah, so that will be um, what this indicates is sort of more of the, um, the scale species, the softer scale species. So we um, they're really difficult to spray off. The armour scale um, really are very tricky to control. So we use uh, a combination of things like contact sprays and systemic um, sprays as well to try and get control of these scales. Um, as you can see here on the right hand side, what how they complete their life cycle, the adult basically sits on top as a protective layer. Um, it sits on top of all the young, of all the crawlers. 
Um, so if we we're applying sort of a spray application, you can imagine that the spray application is hitting that adult, that dead adult, and not actually penetrating into where the where those crawlers, where the next generation are. So very difficult to control, um, which is why we sort of look at a, a, a spray program that we can integrate alongside the biologicals um, to try and target really effectively target sort of scale species. In terms of the biological control, I put Chilochorus up here, which is again another ladybird species that is that was very effective for controlling scale. Unfortunately, we've lost that from the production. Um, so uh, hopefully it will come back at some point, but um, yeah, we've, we've basically lost our main supply for that. So it's sort of left a bit of a gap for scale species, uh, for scale sort of control. Um, outside of the realms of just conventional chemistry uh, insecticides. Um, so we, we can use entomopathogenic num uh, nematodes, things like the Steinonema feltii nematodes, um, which can be applied as sort of a foliar spray directly to where those um, scale are located. And they basically infect the soft scale in particular, in particular and, um, and basically infect. So we can get a bit of an effective um, knockdown control of specifically soft scale species uh, with nematodes. Uh, for caterpillar control, so um, the eggs are, um, I won't go into too much detail in terms of the, the life cycle, but the eggs are basically laid uh, generally on the leaf surface and then the caterpillar um, emerges out and uh, creates the sort of windowing damage. Uh, so I think I've got the uh, identification yeah so so you can sort of see in the middle here uh, where the sort of feeding damage sort of occurs on the leaf surface and it creates this sort of windowing effect um, in the leaf surface so very distinct uh, for caterpillar and then the fecal matter on the right hand side uh, that's produced and um, the majority of the time see th uh, sort of tortric species which is a big group of um, of uh, moth species um, and they basically, when they go to pupate, they stitch the leaf surface together, as we can see on the left hand side. So when we open up that leaf, we'll basically see the caterpillar uh, within there, um, ready to basically pupate. So sort of key identification for, for caterpillar. In terms of biological control, we mainly we mainly look at sort of spray applications. Now there was a there was um, a predatory species. Um, uh, there was a trichogramma, which was uh, on the market, which was um, removed just because of um, licensing and, and fears of sort of establishing uh, outside of um, outside of sort of a protected environment. So the biological companies are, are looking uh, further uh, um, into sort of different trichogramma species we can use. So hopefully we should get something back on the market just to target that sort of parasitize that sort of egg stage of caterpillar. But at the moment, we use um, predominantly sprays, uh, things like Bacillus thuringiensis, which you probably know if you're if you're sort of using professional products and have spraying qualifications uh, in the product Dipel. Um, so this basically uh, Dipel the, or the Bacillus thuringiensis active um, gets ingested by the caterpillar um, as it needs to physically feed on it and then it crystallizes within the mid gut. So um, when we're using those products, we look to mix them with a tracker or, or some sort of, which is an adjuvant um, or some sort of sugar um, sugar adjuvant within the Dipel um, or BT uh, products that we're using just to try and increase the efficacy of the spray, spray uh, solution. Um, just to get, just to encourage feeding on the spray residue. We can also use things like Macrolophus, as we spoke about for the white fly control, which will target sort of the early instalarval stages of the caterpillar. Moving on to leaf miner, so Phytomyza is a really key species, and as you can see on the right top right hand side, um, it sort of goes through three instalarval stages on the leaf on the top side of the leaf surface, with each sort of mine getting larger and larger as it goes through its life cycle. Um, it's a basically a fly species, as you can see on the right hand, uh, sort of on the bottom picture on the left hand side. So that's the adult stage of phytomyza. Um, and we can use yellow traps to basically effectively catch uh, the adult stage. Um, and we also have diglyphus, which is again a parasitoid wasp, which injects an egg directly into that mine where the larvae is positioned, and it will instantly stop feeding from there. So a very good, uh, a very good uh, parasitoid wasp, very um, 
boost very abundantly in the uh, um, through a crop canopy. And we've, if we're depending on the amount of plants we're dealing with, if there is an option to sort of pinch out the the mines as well, obviously a very method of control, um, but always, yeah, also an option in of itself um, if we if we are able to do it, depending on how big an area we're dealing with. So it's sort of getting towards the end of the talk. So sort of soil dwelling pests, I wanted to cover a bit on uh, vine weed control. So um, for vine weed control, obviously with the loss of um, a lot of systemic actives, um, things like exemptor that have gone on, uh, that we've um, that have been removed from the market, we're predominantly reliant on just nematodes for application. Um, so uh, just just for control of the larval stages. Um, so we we generally apply a sort of um, for the nemesis L and exhibit line H both on the left hand side um, of the table. So the Heterohabodites is the higher temperature nematode species. So we've got uh, which will be active um, from about 12 degrees and above. And I'll as I move on to the next slide, we'll look at how we sort of approach those through the season in terms of an application. Um, so but just remembering that the sort of exhibit line H, H meaning higher or heterohabodites meaning higher. And then we've got the nemesis L meaning the lower temperature. So the nemesis L or cyanonema krausei um, is basically active down to about five degrees. So we can generally switch up between the two species depending on the time of the year. Um, and they'll basically go to, um, we'll apply them as a drench application with that sort of dosatron. Um, I won't go too far into depth about sort of methods of application, but if you do have any questions, um, yeah, feel free to ask at the end. But um, with the, we can put them through dosatrons or in smaller areas, sort of watering cans and things like that, or via overhead irrigation, or through sort of handheld sprayers as well just ensuring that we're removing all of the uh, fine filters, anything um, below sort of a mil, um, uh, it's important to sort of remove out of that irrigation system. Otherwise we will get a backup of um, the nematodes backing up in the system. Um, so yeah, uh, the vine weevil damage. Um, so we've got the adult stage on the left, on the right hand side. Um, so the adult damage basically causes that notching around the outer edge of the leaf and it literally looks like somebody's gone with a, a, the hole punch around the outside of the leaf surface. Um, and then the larval stage, um, so they, the larvae um, sort of on the on the right, uh, sort of the left hand side of the right, right side of the presentation. Um, uh, so that's the larval stages that we're trying to target with these nematodes. Um, so the Sinonema krausei and Hepterohabodites. Uh, and then we've got the leather jackets on the left hand side. So we can use this species, things like the Hepterohabodites or the exhibit line H uh, for things like chafer grub control. Um, and we can use the Sinonema felti. So the, the, the nematodes on the right hand side species. Um, so we can use the Sinonema felti for things like scarab fly, thrips, leaf minor, leather jackets. Um, and then the copper capsi on the far right hand side we use for things like leather jackets, cutworms, and we can also use them for, for a bit of caterpillar control as a foliar application as well. Um, so we mainly use these, these four species of nematodes um, and they all have their sort of specific um, host ranges. So um, yeah, we just use them for, um, for different, for different uh, controls through the season depending on the environmental condition. Uh, so that's just going into how the entomopathogenic nematodes work. So basically the nematodes are applied. They then uh, move through the soil structure and infect the host. Um, once in the host, um, the larval stage of say a vine weevil, they then release a, a bacteria which starts to break down the host and basically provides a food source for the nematodes. The nematodes will then feed, reproduce and basically build up their populations within the host. And then once the host is spent, they'll then evacuate out and then go over on to further infect another host. Um, and they'll persist in good populations for about six weeks as long as they're the environment staying in a in a in good optimum conditions for them. Um, so not drying out too much, basically. And that's just looking at sort of the, the vine weaver life cycle and how we approach it. So 
um, starting off sort of in the spring months, um, so around around uh, getting on for now. So sort of um, going into sort of late March, April time, we'd look at um, doing that application of the Nemesis L, which is again remember the lower temperature nematode species, so active down to uh, five degrees, um, four or five degrees. Um, so we'll apply that, and it will basically target the majority of any pupating stages of the fine weevil before it emerges as, a, as an adult, because the adults are are really difficult to try and get control of, and we don't really have any effective spray applications that we can apply for for the adult control. The adults then um, emerge out as this pupil stage and go on to create that leaf notching. So we've got a product called Nematop, um, which is um, which we can use for just hotspot targeting. It's not cost effective to put it across a wide area, but just for hotspot targeting where we've got that real intense area of sort of leaf notching going on. And all it is, the nematop is just a, a block, a wooden block with grooves cut out of it. And within those grooves, you've basically got a gel formulation of nematodes in there. And the, the vine weevil with adults basically crawl into those grooves, rub their backs on the gel formulation, and then it goes into, uh, basically infects the, infects the adults that way. And they'll crawl away from that, uh, from the nematop trap um, and die. So you, you never really see the, the adults dead underneath there, but if you do, Roots around you should see some some dead uh, vine weevil adults underneath uh, pots and things like that. Um, we've got pitcher, which is a uh, which is an ICL product. So um, so moving away from sort of nematodes, this is a garlic extract um, product that we can apply as a top dressing for ornamental plant production, which is on emu. Um, so extension of authorization. Um, and this is basically targeting the egg stage, so it's able to the volatiles that are given off from the the garlic extract basically break down the outer wall of the vine weevil, and uh, yeah, just provide some extra control for that stage of the life cycle. It's important that we're sort of outside the six week period of um, of of applying nematodes because it will persist as a nematicide, or it will kill nematodes um, for up to um six weeks after application so ensuring that we're applying the nematodes outside of that window we then move forward um to sort of our, our summer autumn application um which uh is using sort of the high temperature nematode species so active up to uh, 12 degrees and above um so this is targeting anything that's been laid through the season um, and targeting it before the larval stages before they bury too deep into the soil structure. Um, so the, the nematodes have the highest efficacy when the larvae are in the upper stages of the soil structure. So we can apply the nematodes at that sort of time and know that we're getting a very good hit across the majority of the uh, across the uh, majority of the vine with larvae that have been late um, that have emerged out basically from the eggs. Um, we can also look to remix with transporter, which is again an ICL product. So uh, looking, the transporter is a wetting agent. So as I said, the nematodes need a film of moisture to move through. So this wetting agent basically just increases their efficacy, um, reduces down any losses if, if the soil structure does, is a bit dry that they're hitting. Um, so yeah, it's just a really good product that we can just add into a mix just to try and improve the efficacy and the, uh, the sort of get good populations um, applied within that substrate. It's worth saying actually, just with the vine weevil uh, life cycle, this is only a guide. So if you are getting problems outside of these ranges, then then you can look to apply just looking at those temperatures. Um, we we did have a bit of an issue last year with sort of the mold conditions um, persisting into the winter months. Um, so uh, we we are having some early issues with with vine weevils. So it's not always as easy as it this with with looking at a vine weevil life cycle because they are so um, their laying season is extending with the milder conditions. So always keep an eye out for them if you've got any activity of the larval stages. Obviously, just being aware of those temperatures that the nematodes work in and just selecting that species accordingly um, is important. So. Yeah, sort of just the last knockings of the talk. So as I spoke about banker plants, so as you can see within this poinsettia crop, how effective like spe uh, plant species such as aubergines can be within within a growing environment. So we're effectively with these banker plants pulling those pest species out of the crop onto a more desirable plant. So 
things like aubergines where which has a really thick hairy leaf surface we can effectively establish biologicals things like macrolophus and in, uh, the incarsia on these plant species so we can get effective increased trap or increased um, populations of um, or density of, of pests on these plants um, so they're not feeding on the surrounding crop and we get higher predation or parasitize, uh, parasitization rates, for example, on these plant species. So we can effectively get a sort of natural biological control buildup on these plants. Um, so things like calendula um, work really well. I work with um, sort of, uh, organic growers and they swear by growing calendula alongside sort of organic veg and things like that. Um, and we see really good natural populations of macrolophus on things like calendula on those plant species, things like salvia and tomato, and even wheat, uh, sort of wheat banker plants we can use for um, building up populations of specifically um, grain aphids on, so we can, um, so things like the aphidious wasps can parasitize those specific aphids, and the aphids won't move off their monocot um, host plant, so, um, so yeah, we can basically get an increase in um, natural populations of parasitoids um, within the environment, so yeah, just, just something to consider. Obviously, always monitoring the bank of plants. If we are getting too much of a buildup um, with pests to try and spray them off, or if it is if it has got too out of hand on these bank of plants, we can always just remove them from the environment um, if they are going to, if they are sort of degrading and there is a risk of sort of those pest species migrating from the bank of plant on back onto the surrounding crop. So just always monitoring them. They're a really good monitoring tool um, when we're crop walking. And sticky traps, so as I said through the talk, there's an extensive range of sticky traps. Obviously, the yellow sticky traps are the generalist, uh, generalist traps. So um, yeah, very effective for a vast range of things we've spoken about in this talk. So white fly, uh, winged aphids, thrips, winged, uh, winged thrips, adults, um, things like leaf, leaf miners um, and scarid. Um, and then we've got things like the blue sticky traps, um, which are more a bit more specific for thrips, um, a bit more effective. Um, and we also do red sticky traps, which are very effective. We haven't spoken about leaf hoppers in this uh, in this uh, talk, but red sticky traps are used more widely for things like leaf hopper control. Um, we've just seen a bit uh, better rates of catch off of that color. And there's there's all sorts of different sticky trap designs out there for for specific pests. And we also do the uh, the um, pheromones as well, which which are incorporated within some of these traps for things like Western flower thrips as well. So very important that we've got these abundantly within the environment. Um, so, yeah. That's, yeah, that's um, just sort of continues on from from what I was saying about the range of 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 pest species that we can catch with these sticky traps. So things like um, aphid, winged aphid, thrips, um, sort of, uh, uh, the um, white fly and um, leaf miners. So yeah, we can we can get a, an extensive range of catch off of off of these sticky traps. Um, but yeah, that's just to say thanks thanks for your attention. I don't know how far over I've run, um, but um, yeah, I uh, hope that was useful. And yeah, if you need to get in contact, um, uh, our bar sales line. Um, so that's for any ordering or anything like that of biological control. Um, yeah, just feel free to drop us an email or um, or, or the number. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, that was very interesting and very informative. Uh, I certainly picked up a few things I know. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if you, we'll take a few questions. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll take maybe one or two. I know we're a bit over time, so okay. yeah. That's one fine. of the questions came in there, Alex, is um, maybe a bit of a broad one, but in regards to pests and diseases, what do you see as one of the big challenges for growers going into the future? I think the big challenge is a lot of the loss of conventional chemistry on the on the market is going to be. A bit more of an issue moving forwards. Um, we're losing some really key actives off off the market, and obviously that narrowing of actives creates more of an increase in resistance levels um, for for key pests. Um, and a lot of these biologicals, they they sit within the preventative approach. So 
they, if you if you establish them early, generally we'll get really good controls of them. But every now and again, as I was sort of saying through the talk, if we get big evacuations off surrounding areas of things like whitefly of 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 thrips, then we do sometimes need to turn to a spray application to try and knock down those those big populations coming in because we won't get um, really effective control firefighting with biologicals. So I think that is. That's one of the issues moving forward is the fact that the majority of what's coming along in the market is sits within the preventative control rather than curative. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one of the main main challenges moving forward, but it sort of emphasizes the need to really understand how these biologicals are working and those life cycles and uh, how we can how can we can approach them really effectively with the biocontrol program um, just so we're not just so we're, we're mitigating any risk or the majority of the risk around sort of ex extensive populations of pests building up. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess too is where would be a good starting point for a grower that's looking to begin or incorporate an IPM? Uh, yeah, I know we so did discuss a little bit at yeah, the start. Yeah, but... yeah, we did. We sort of, um, yeah, we sort of touched on it a bit, um, uh, yeah, earlier on, but um, I think Going back to that sort of vine weaver control, that's what we're finding is because because um, growers have been very used to sort of turning to a spray chemical um, as an option, and, and we've had a very extensive portfolio of of broad spectrum insecticides to use that have been very effective for a broad range of pest species. Um, things like vine weaver are becoming more and more of an issue, and and we've lost. Uh, We've lost those soil incorporated products, things like the exemptor products and, and those neonicotinoids sort of actives. Um, so really the starting the starting points um, of, of um, growers mainly moving into biologicals is through that route of nematode applications with the vine weaver control. Um, that's generally where we see it. Obviously, if they're not getting if they're not getting issues with with um, with vine weevil, um, sort of looking at other sort of choosing one species to try and approach what trying to approach the key species that we're seeing first and really getting a comprehensive cover of biologicals um, is really sort of the, a good starting point I think and speaking to advisors as well making sure that you're sort of not just buying this stuff in and and sort of chucking out hoping for the best obviously that's what we're here for to actually ask advice of us and 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 just just Get us out there, get us on the ground with you guys, and we're we're happy to work alongside you, basically, just to provide that support moving forward, it's just to ease you into that sort of um, moving into sort of biological control. Because it's these these are obviously uh, trying to cram this talk into an hour is very difficult when a lot of these products are quite technical. So yeah, it requires a bit more. Um, it just requires time, really, and and uh, with these biologicals and and help from us as advisors, really, to to um, provide that advice and and just to try and get that really effective control. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, kind of going back to the first question, someone just asked there was, uh, do you think we'll get to a stage where we'll be just relying solely on biocontrols, or we can control biocontrols as well? I guess. I. Do. I don't think so. I don't think there'll ever be a time when we're when we're solely reliant on biological control because there's always going to need to be we're always going to need to resort to some curative curative control. But it's it is all moving in the right direction in terms of we we we're a lot more precise in terms of what we're applying and and we're we're having a lot less impact on on sort of native species and improving biodiversity by going down the route of biological control. Um, but it's always going to be important that we do have some of those chemical actives in our armory to actually provide control for um, for some of those key pest species. Because as I'm saying, sort of, it's important that um, that we would yeah that we have those controls in place if we do get a big build up because we just Trying to firefight, as I said, with biologicals is is um, yeah. You can throw a lot of money uh, with biological control at a pest and and not see huge huge. Um, it'd be hugely effective, really. Um, so we just look. That's why we look at trying to integrate it. So we're not just turning as a first resort to those spray products, as those to those spray actives. 
um, to that conventional chemistry as a first resort, we can, we're sort of looking at the biological control first. And in doing that, we're reducing down our reliance on those sort of narrowing actives um, that we've got on the market so that they're more effective when we come to use them at a later date. Yep, yep. that sounds great. Thank you. Um, we'll finish up with that. I think that's all the questions that there was. Uh, thanks again, Alex, for a, a very Brilliant. informative I hope presentation. That, hope that was useful. Very much so, and thanks for everyone for attending as well. Um, hope you've all got something out of it. And if you have any questions afterwards, you can send them on to me, and I can send them on to Alex as well. Brilliant. Brilliant.